Well, friends, we're glad to be here with you this morning at Downsview Baptist Church. Thank you for the opportunity to enter into God's presence amongst his people. As we begin this morning, I'm going to ask you to stand with me and have a word of prayer together to ask God's help. So, Heavenly Father, we ask in your Son's name for your kind, benevolent attitude and actions towards us. That you would, I pray, dear God, present yourself with each one of us individually today, such that Christ would be lifted up in this place, and that his value and worth would be on display. And when that happens, dear God, we pray you will draw us closer to yourself. For those who are yours, dear God, we pray that we would be more like you as we draw closer to you, frankly, as you draw us closer to you. And for those, Heavenly Father, that you may have drawn here who have yet to surrender their lives to the joyful allegiance to the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray you'd move by your spirit today and be pleased to show yourself the gloriously beautiful savior that you are and the knees would be bowed with joy. And we pray these things through Christ, amen. Please have your seats, friends. We do have a couple of announcements this morning and I want you to think through the announcements this morning with me as an act of worship. I say the announcements are act, an act of worship because the fact is that life in the body at Downsview Baptist Church needs to be an act of worship. It needs to be more than simply Sunday morning, but throughout our week as we join ourselves together. So the opportunity we have to meet now at 1030 each Sunday morning, uh, I know a number of folks have said everyone understands that. The fact is, it usually takes a month or six weeks for it all to filter down and filter down into our hearts. And the joy and the opportunity that we have is God's people to meet, to meet with freedom, to meet with the opportunity to see one another, to enjoy the kind of fellowship that God gives us as we knit ourselves together. Not only do we meet at 10.30 for our worship service, but also our prayer meeting is at 10.30. We wanted to have both of those times sync together so it's easy for everyone to remember. The opportunity we take each Wednesday morning here at the church to pray and to lift up the church family we, we know that we don't force God's hand when we pray. We don't come before God, as you've heard me say, to manipulate God or to demand of God or even to instruct God. God, here's what we need you to do as if he doesn't know. And yet the Bible tells us all the time that prayer does change things and that God moves through the means of prayer. And frankly, we are willing to leave most of that in his hands, aren't we? We obey him, we lift up before him our prayer requests, our praises, our confessions, and our adorations. And this morning, we're so grateful to have Victor here already. Victor had surgery on his eye this past week. We prayed diligently at prayer meeting on Wednesday, and so many of you. I really didn't think we were going to see you here so soon. Praise the Lord, brother. Glad that you're here as a picture of an answer to prayer. So praise God for that. Again, so many of you are understanding and giving faithfully that the giving that happens in this church is what funds this ministry. We praise you for praise God for you as the means of grace that God is using to fund our ministry. The Bible tells us throughout the scriptures that we ought to give thanks in all circumstances. That doesn't mean that everything is happy and joyful in those circumstances, but all the more when it is. When we see God's people supporting the ministry of God's work, we're grateful for that and we're thankful for you, for you doing that at Downsview. If you would like to give in the e-transfer and you're not sure how to do that, just go to downsviewbaptistchurch.com and there is a part there that will show you all the instructions needed to give that way. This morning or later this afternoon, we are going to have this monumental opportunity here at our church to help a group of Nepalese brothers and sisters to worship together in their own language. And that is the key distinction that pastor, as it will, the, at least a gentleman who is pastoring them on mall, that's his goal, to find his brothers and sisters culturally and linguistically from Scarborough to Mississauga to be brought together after a year of Zoom. Today is their first anniversary of meeting on Zoom. One year ago they began, and here they are today at 1.30. They're gonna be meeting downstairs and in our church family. I'll go to give uh, greetings on behalf of our church family. If you happen to find yourself closer to church at 1.30, of course, 
you'd be welcome to be there. But do please be in prayer for Anmal, Prince, Javin. You've met them. They've been here for five or six weeks already, but that's this afternoon. What an opportunity for worship. Church membership is something that, as you know, is to be an extension of our life in the body. The Bible doesn't simply tell us to be baptized independently of a church, but you know we do it as an act of worship, one of the ordinances, something that God has ordered within his church to be something done publicly and as a, a part of a local church family. Well, church membership is that step. It's the next step to say, all right, now that I have shown myself to give myself in devotion to the Lord, in allegiance to Christ, to publicly nail my sails to the mast, as it were, now I'm saying I will not only identify with the head of the body, but also with indeed the members of the body of Christ. We have sought over the last three or four years to teach through and, and to see the importance of church membership to come all more, all the more specifically. And so today you are going to hear from Steve and, and Tina Poirier. Uh, this is a picture from one of their wedding vow renewals. Uh, we used to do that five or six years in a row, the, all of us together. It was wonderful. Uh, but Steve and Tina Poirier, who, if you know Pam and I, you know Steve and Tina. They've been here as long as, as we've been here. And so they have uh, moved a little closer to Toronto. And they have, in our great joy, decided to come and be part of our church family here. Not just in service, but in practical church membership. And so on the way in, you may have seen a yellow sheet. Just as we did a couple of weeks ago, we're going to have a short business meeting immediately after church today. One half has the minutes from the last meeting. The other side has the motion, which is moved by Ruth LeBlanc and seconded by Colleen McDonald, that Steve and Tina Poirier would become full covenant partners of our church. So that you understand them even a little deeper, they are both going to give their testimony this morning later in our service to the glory of God and to the encouragement of all of us. So please, would you please plan to just stay for a short business meeting immediately following our service today. We'd appreciate that very much. That's uh, just about noon, noon today afterwards. Next Sunday, Pam and I are taking a bit of a respite. I realized when I started to look at my holidays, I thought it seems that I often take them in a row. Well, if we don't begin them until almost the end of May, then it, I guess they get tend to get bung, uh, bunched up a little bit. But next Sunday is going to be one of the weeks that Pam and I will be away. We have the great privilege of having a brother pastor, Jonathan Kaloran, who is the associate pastor at a Fellowship Bible Church in New Hamburg. Now, it's one of our Feb Central churches. It is pastored by a gentleman named Sean, uh, Sean Simons. Sean and his wife Eleanor and their worship team, you might recall, two years ago on the 8th of May, actually came here with the worship team just to, just to encourage us and, and serve us here at, at Downsview. The next Sunday, we shut down. And so that was a wonderful opportunity for them to come and give us a bit of a highlight before we took some time away. Fact is that Sean being the senior pastor, Jonathan has been their associate pastor for almost three years. And Jonathan will be here next Sunday morning to bring the word. So please be in prayer for him, his wife Christy, and uh, thankful to the Lord for the partnership, practical, functional partnership that we have as part of these almost 300 churches in our Fed Central region. So there's an opportunity to worship there as well. As we bring this part to a close, I do want to ask you to be very grateful to the Lord. You know, the Apostle Paul, when he writes to the church at Thessalonica, he says in the first chapter that those folks at Thessalonica had become an example, not only to the believers in their church, but to the believers beyond. He talks about churches in Macedonia and elsewhere that these believers were an encouragement too. And simply by their lives, the way they were living them was an opportunity for other people to, it says, give thanks or results in much praise and thanks to the Lord. I want to thank so many of you who helped us have a very special Mother's Day service last week. As we again, we were praying at prayer meeting, we said, you know, I just don't want to lose the excitement that we had from last Sunday. It was just such a wonderful mountaintop experience. Our, our church was jammed with people. And you know, it's not all about numbers. But numbers stand for people, which meant there's a lot of people here. It was a wonderful opportunity for us to enjoy that fellowship for the first time in, in two years. Appreciate so many of the brothers who were outside working on the barbecue the whole time. Uh, Andre and Svetna in particular, who had their hospitality team in the basement. 
Appreciated Errol helping organize with Florence, the roses uh, for the ladies. Appreciate you doing that. And then, of course, our dear friends, the Jubilant Singers and Orchestra. I, I hope it was hitting you before this service was over. What a sacrificial service it was for them to be here. I mean, we, we generally show up a little bit before the service starts and we just go. They were here at 7 o'clock in the morning. Some of those folks drove from London, Ontario. London, Ontario to be here with us. You think about what it costs to drive around town for gas. These folks drove a couple of hours just to be here and serve us. We were talking to Janelle and David and, and uh, Wally and a number of the folks we've got to know so well, Leonardo and some of the folks, they had to make special arrangements because their local church families expect them to be there and to serve in their local church families. But they came here to be a service to us and to encourage us. Fact is, friends, that you need to know that Manny, the director, and his wife Lois sent me a special note of gratitude. How special they feel they are treated at Downsview. And I think you, you make an effort, all of you, to do that. To make them feel like they're not just the entertainment. They're not just the people who happen to be serving us today. But they are brothers and sisters in Christ. And boy, I tell you, to be able to praise God for that young man, Archie who just got off the boat, as it were. He got off the plane in, in Pearson and walked all the way to Brampton, for goodness sake. Found himself at a church. And I don't know if you noticed the guy playing the double bass. It was him and his wife who was actually taking him in from the Ukraine. With all that's going on over there, this young man, he was just overwhelmed to see that. And then I was talking with Svetna, this lady named Enya, uh, Irania, Irina? Ar Irina, thank you. She was giving us that beautiful song downstairs at lunchtime afterwards that she wanted to sing a praise to God, especially in Thanksgiving for the mothers. Well, there wasn't a dry eye in that church hall as she was doing that. What a beautiful opportunity. Again, another lady who had just recently come from the Ukraine was here and we were able to worship together. Friends, don't miss those things. Don't miss the opportunity for worship that when we give these announcements, they are. You, you gave just short of $2,000 yet again so that this ministry of this orchestra and singers can support 46 plus pastors and the nation of Cuba. That, that's why they do what they do. They, they were able to send over $50,000 worth of supplies during COVID to help out these pastors in Cuba. And so friends, just understand that the partnership we have in the gospel goes well beyond enjoyable singing. Not less than enjoyable singing. We love that. We're glad to do that with them. But what a beautiful, worshipful opportunity it was for us to have them. So please, as we think about those announcements and what we're doing as a church body, understand them as an act of worship. And so to continue our act of worship, I'm going to ask Diane to come and call us to worship through God's word. Good morning, everyone. Can I ask everyone to stand, please? Today I'm reading from Psalm 46. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. There is a river whose stream makes glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The nations rage, the kingdoms totter. He utters his voice, the earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come, behold the works of the Lord, how he has brought desolations on the earth. He makes war cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us, the God of Jacob is our fortress. I will continue standing as, as she just read, behold the works of God. And there's no more amazing work than the work accomplished on the cross for each and every one of us. And beyond that, the work 
of the Holy Spirit when he resurrected Jesus Christ. The wonderful cross. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, my riches gain I count but lost and poor content. find that I may truly live. Oh, the wonderful cross, oh, the wonderful cross, all who gather here, by grace draw near, and bless your name.
nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other bounds I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. For my part in this I see, nothing but the blood of Jesus. For my cleansing this my plea, Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other bounds I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing can for sin atone, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Not of good that I have done, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the that makes me white as snow. No other bounds I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my hope and peace. Nothing but the blood of Have your seats, friends. Throughout the unfolding of the early church, in the book that we call the book of Acts, perhaps better named the Acts of the Holy Spirit as opposed to the Acts of the Apostles, or the Acts of the Apostles by means of the Holy Spirit, or the Acts of the Holy Spirit through the Apostles, the fact is that Luke volume 2 is what that book is. That the Apostle Luke, who used to be a physician, if you please, uh, it came not only in his gospel account, but in Acts was his volume two. And he says in the beginning of the book of Acts that you heard what I read in what Jesus began to do through his people. And the book of Acts is the unfolding of the people of God connecting through the gospel, both evangelism and conversions and, and discipleship making of other people but also the particulars of life in the body. And the New Testament tells us again throughout that book of Acts that as people came to Christ, they were obedient in the act of baptism as a public sign of their allegiance to Christ. And then they were obedient in the connection, not just with Jesus and by themselves, but with Jesus and with his people. And church membership is something, as I say, we've wanted to celebrate here and to teach on the last few years at Downsview. Mark Dever, I think, says it well, that membership is the church's 
corporate endorsement of a person's salvation. Do you know that? Do you know what that means? We have to be willing to do. We have to pass judgment on people. We have to have an analysis. We have to weigh the information. We need to come to a conclusion and we say, yes, that person we are willing to endorse as a brother or sister in Christ. It's an odd time in church history when it is almost the greatest insult you can make of someone and say, how dare you question whether or not I'm a Christian. Friends, the New Testament knows nothing about that insult. The New Testament says to encourage the local church People in that church will examine others who are potential members so that as they come together, they know they legitimately not just have a friendship or an interaction with each other, but deep koinonia. That is a shared personal vision of fellowshipping together. And so as we say this morning, before we have a brief business meeting at the end of our church service today, you're going to hear something of the testimonies of God's grace. Our dearest friends, Steve and and Tina Poirier. As most of you know, Steve and Tina and Pam and I got to know each other back at uh, First Baptist Church in Thunder Bay. I think it was 16 years ago. Nicole, 18? Oh my goodness. Okay. It was a long time ago. Less 20 years or so, almost, we've been together. They then, we followed them to Sault Ste. Marie. Steve ended up doing his medical residency there. And two months later, Pam and I ended up there. That was God's timing and God's planning for that. That was wonderful. Steve and Tina were a part of our church for the first two years that we were there. Steve actually served as an elder overseeing the worship at uh, Bethany Baptist Church there in Sault Ste. Marie. And then they moved to King Carden and we missed them for a little while. And they moved to Barrie and we decided to follow them yet again. So they can't get rid of us. Like gum under their shoe uh, some days. (laughs) I'm <laughs> just really glad that, as I say, you know Steve and Tina have been here for our candidating time. They were here for our first service. They were here for our induction service. And they've been part of our church these last five years. But you get to hear not about our relationship with them as much as how Christ's relationship got a start and how it continues with them. So, friends, come and tell us what the Lord has done with you. So we were given an opportunity for the church membership to get to know us a little bit more personally um, in order for you guys to vote and have a a good conscience to vote yes or no, whether you would want us part of your membership. I mean, you've seen us up here, you've heard stories about us. I don't think I've shared my heart with too many of you. And so this is an opportunity to share that. Uh, My wonderful wife, Tina, who hates doing these kinds of things, being in public, yet never shies away from proclaiming her testimony, testimony about how Christ saved her. So I'll give her the, the opportunity now. Yeah, we'll start with a short, sweet one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, most days. <laughs> so my name's Tina. Uh, I was blessed enough to be in a Christian home from a very young age. My father's always been a deacon or an elder in the church, always very involved. Um, I, my mom was involved in the children's ministry and her thing was vacation Bible school. It was always held at our house because we had a big uh, backyard. So everybody would come over and we'd do it outside. And I remember I was about five and after everybody went home, I wanted to talk to mom a little more about, um, about salvation and what it entailed. And at that point... I said the prayer, but I think maybe I was a little too young. I didn't quite understand it just yet. Um, And then I was going on eight years old, and I was watching a movie with my mom at church, and it was a movie about uh, hell, and it scared me. I went home, I was in bed, and I woke up at two o'clock in the morning and went and woke my mom up (laughs) and did it for real that time. So I was around eight years old when I got saved, and I am deathly afraid of water. So it took me a while to get baptized. I know all it is is a quick little dunk, but yeah, I, I was almost 13 when I got baptized. Uh, finally got that done, and after I did that, I started becoming involved in the children's ministries as well. I was a helper uh, from the time I was 13 all the way to graduating high school. And in um, Thunder Bay, I was involved in the nursery ministry. 
And then Sault Ste. Marie, I helped out with the kids. And then uh, in our church in Barrie, I helped out as well with the uh, kids there. And the, the little ones are my heart. That's, that's where I like to be. Um, and I'll let him take over from here. <laughs> That's going to be a while. <laughs> uh, I am absolutely blessed to be married to such a woman. So uh, when you give me the pulpit, I'm going to take advantage and, and give you my story as best I can. Um, you hear many testimonies and you hear about the before and after. You know, I was this before and I'm that after. And I love that. And we need to see that truth. We need to understand that truth. We need to praise God for that truth of our life changed. But I want to take this opportunity to show you what passage God decided to open my eyes to and, and save me from the grips of hell. And so, um, a little bit of a background. I grew up as a Roman Catholic and um, I was an altar boy and I loved serving in the church. I went to church every Sunday. Uh, I, te I attended conf confession weekly once I was allowed to, uh, and I worked hard to be a good Catholic. I took great pride in my work, my attendance. Uh, I was even so prideful that when I went away to university, my parents didn't need to tell me to go to church. I went on my own. And so I was so proud of that, so happy of that. I worked, uh, just worked to be a good, a good person. Uh, my belief at that time from uh, how I was raised was belief in Jesus plus faith in my works equaled my salvation. I could earn my way to heaven uh, if I just had Jesus by my side, but then I would do all the work over here and end up there one of these days. So life was going amazing. I had a great upbringing, great family. Um, I was so blessed throughout, and it's easy to look back now and see God's hand in everything he's done. Uh, I had graduated as a chiropractor and had an amazing job where I went around in the States and built practices and sold them for tons of money, making tons of money. Uh, I was engaged to be married to uh, a high school sweetheart, um, and everything was just going wonderfully. Uh, my pride went along with it and grew and grew and grew and grew until God humbled me. God humbled me by having my fiance leave me, uh, even though I was faithful to her, which I took pride in. Uh, and then my mother got sick and passed away at age 46. And so it just felt like everybody was leaving me at that time. So what do I do? I go to the local Catholic church and I go to the priest and I explain the story. What can I do? What can I do? What can I do to make this better? And so the priests confess your sins, which I did, and then gave me to do 10 Hail Marys and three Our Fathers. And I looked at him and I said, is that it? I said, yeah. And so I left that church even more devastated than I had been before because I've been doing that all along and this still happened. So I begrudgingly kept going to church because I wanted to do the right thing to make sure I earned my way to, to, to heaven. Uh, fast forward a few, a couple years later, I, I, I get a job uh, which my company also went, the company I worked for also went bankrupt at the same time that everything was, was tumbling down. Got a job in Elkhart, Indiana, and that's where I met Tina, who's now my wife. And uh, we got to know each other, and we got on the, the uh, topic of faith and religion and whatnot, because I wanted her to come to Catholic Church with me, and, and she wouldn't have it. <laughs> and I call her a seed planter. She's such a gracious woman that God used. Uh, to plant those seeds in my life. She knew I was an academic person. I love reading. I love studying. I love finding out the truth. And I love arguing that, that side of things. And so she would just plant seeds by questioning, well, where does it say that in the Bible? Where do you find that in the Bible? Where is it that you have to do all the work in the Bible? 
No one had ever encouraged me to really read the Bible. And so that's what I wanted to do now, is I started reading, and this is where God had saved me and opened my eyes to the truth. So there's a few Bible in front of you. If you want to open it to page 1159, so 1159, it's in the first chapter of Ephesians. And this is Ephesians 1 and 2, are the two passages that opened my eyes to our King Jesus and, and what he's done for us. So as I read through here, if you have your own Bible and you have a pencil, I would highlight some of these areas in the passage that just show you what Jesus has done. It's all Him. That was the biggest eye-opener for me. He did it all. And so I'll read through here, and I'll start in uh, verse 3, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3, again on page 11, uh, 1100. Uh, 59 in your pew Bible. Blessed be the God and our Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before Him. In love, He predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of His will, to the praise of His glorious grace, which He has blessed us in the Beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set before in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things to him in heaven and things on earth. In him we have obtained inheritance, having predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who are the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him you have also heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him were sealed with the promise of the Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. So I'll just quickly take you through there and list out what's in that passage that hit me. He has blessed us. He has chosen us that we should be holy and blameless before him. He predestined us for adoption. He blessed us with the glorious, his glorious grace. In him we have redemption and forgiveness. He has revealed the mystery of his will. In him we have obtained an inheritance. In him we have heard the word of truth the gospel of our salvation. Not once did it mention Steve Poirier in that passage. Not once did I have to work to make that passage become true. It is true despite what I think of it. He did it all. Jesus did it all. And so you follow that up by chapter 2. And this is really where you get smacked. Uh, into reality. And it just brought me to my knees. And so we start in verse 1, chapter 2, verse 1. And you were dead. Dead in your trespasses and in sin in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body, and the mind, and we're, and we're by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. There's where I was. There's what I was doing. I finally found where I was in this passage, and it's in the start of chapter 2. That is all my work was doing, following my desires for what I wanted out of life, not for what my king wanted for me. And then in verse 4, but God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive again together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. It's not of your own doing. It's a gift of God. Not the results of works. 
so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And so we see that even despite what I was doing, he still loved me and still had a plan for me and gripped me through this passage. And when I look at what, what grace is, I had to look at define. My, my first language is French, so I look up English words all the time to see what the definition means so I don't miss anything. And grace is to do honor or credit to someone or something by one's presence. Jesus gives us, he gives us the credit by his presence in our lives and by what he's done. It's also the spontaneous, unmerited gift of the divine favor in salvation of sinners and in the divine influence operating in individuals for their regeneration and sanctification. So we receive the salvation by this grace in that definition. And I had to understand what is belief, what is faith. We see that here. We saw in chapter one, we believe. We see that we're saved through faith. Well, what does that mean? So when I study that a little bit more, the belief in, and faith differ chiefly in that belief as a rule suggests little more than intellectual assent. I know Jesus. I believe in Jesus. And this is where I use the example that even the demons believed in Jesus and yet shuddered. So belief wasn't enough. It was the start. But faith implies in addition to the element of trust or confidence. And so I had to have faith. So I had to have trust or confidence in something. And as I said earlier, I had faith and confidence in my own works. Yet this passage totally destroyed that. And I need to have trust and confidence in the work of Jesus Christ and what he's accomplished on the cross at the resurrection and what he continues to accomplish in my life changing me sanctifying me day by day by day until it is finished when I'm called home so my new equation is belief in Jesus and have faith in his works and I use the example of you guys are all sitting in a pew. This is not my example. I've stole this example, but it helps me. You're all sitting in a pew. You all believe it's a pew. And yet you've exercised faith today in trusting and having confidence that that pew would hold you up. And that's what it is in Jesus. I believe Jesus and the trust and confidence that he will do what he said he's going to do. And he's done what he said he has done. And so I just want to take this time to, to thank the elders for giving me this opportunity to give my testimony and just open up my heart to you a little bit more so that when you vote later on, you'll know me just a little bit more. And so thank you. Pastors asked me to give thanks for uh, for this couple and how God has worked in their hearts and lives. Let's stand as we pray together. Father, we we thank you for for your grace in our lives, God's riches at Christ's expense. We thank you for your mercy, getting not getting what we deserve. And so, our Father, we thank you for Tina. Thank you for Steve and how you've worked in their lives. We thank thee, our Father, that we were all born in sin. We all didn't know anything about Christ until someone told us. And so we thank thee, our Father, this morning that in your sovereign purposes, that you allowed them to hear the gospel. And we thank thee for Tina and her faithfulness, sharing what she believed uh, to the one that she fell in love with, the Father. We think of other people in our church that the, mother, the uh, wives led their husbands or were instrumental in their husbands coming to Christ and so we thank thee for Tina and I thank thee for 
for Steve and his uh, ability, his gift. He's a, he's a doctor, our father, and uh, we thank thee that you've brought him into that uh, capacity. And yet, our father, we, we thank thee for their love for Christ and for their desire to be involved, to serve in our church. And so we just uh, thank you again and again for bringing people into our midst that can serve you and, and build it. Uh, the work up here and we, we are just instruments in your hand and so we just pray you'll take each of us that are members of this church and use us in the days ahead that through our faithfulness and our teaching of your word that's inspired by you God breathed and it's profitable for doctrine for reproof for correction so bless us our father as we as we just uh, heard uh, what God is doing in their hearts and lives and we just pray that it might be something that will strike in someone maybe that's here this morning to make them aware that they need Jesus Christ as their savior too. So bless us, bless them, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. So as we sing this next song, I hope you take it, you may have a seat. Oops, sorry. But you take in mind what I just talked about, what grace is, and so when we sing Amazing Grace. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now. Grace that taught my heart to fear and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear the hour I first. Chains are gone, I've been set free, my God, my Savior has ransomed me, like a flood, His mercy reigns, unending love, amazing. will be 
sing our next song called Man of Sorrows, talking about all the work that Jesus did for us so that we can have faith in him.
Amen. Amen. Please have your seats, friends. I invite you at this time to open your Bibles again to Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 2. Is it 11.59 in the Pew Bibles? Is that, is that right? Okay. You have an outline in front of you, a little blue piece of paper which says Galatians chapter 3. That's correct, but that'll be next time. I was waiting to see how the Spirit might prompt us this morning in terms of what Steve and Tina might share in their testimonies. Because Ephesians chapter 2 is a precious text to many of us. And by God's grace, we will attempt to walk through it to the glory of his name for a few minutes this morning. Would you pray with me and ask God's special help this morning? Heavenly Father, what a joy it is to hear the sounds of salvation. To sing the songs of salvation. To hear the proclamation of your work in the hearts of your people to the praise and glory of your grace. That's the echo in the first chapter of this glorious book, dear God, and it is the echo of Steve and Tina's life, and we desire it to be the echo of all of our lives. I pray, Heavenly Father, for those who come to know us, that what they would know about us is that we seek to live to the praise of the glorious grace of our Lord. Dear God, we need your help to do that now. And as we walk through the scripture now this morning, Heavenly Father, I pray it would be indeed your spirit's ministry to minister to my heart and that out of my mouth and into the hearts of my friends here would come what you have prepared for us. So I pray, Heavenly Father, for help now. We praise you, dear God, for what we have heard and what we have sung. We pray now that the Holy Spirit who has written this word would bring it to life. And bring it to life in each of our hearts as your people. We pray through Christ. Amen. I began in ministry just short of 30 years ago. The first sermon that I preached was Ephesians chapter 2 verses 1 to 10. And I did that because growing up like Steve, Roman Catholic, and coming to faith through, like Steve, my wife's ministry, and having a very proud, like Steve, spirit. I say I'm a lot like Steve, but you understand when we talk about people being equal, we are equally fallen. <laughs> we are equally sinners before the Lord. Equally, all of us in need of the enabling grace of our King. And so being a good Roman Catholic boy who thought I wanted to be a priest... It's the only word I had for what I realized was a calling upon my life, not only to be a Christian, but to be a Christian pastor. I came to my parents a number of times and told them what I wanted to do. They encouraged me in that. I went, like my brother, to church when I was in high school and even university. No one had to tell me. But I was quite proud of the fact that I went and my other friends did not go. Look at me, Lord. Aren't you impressed with what I'm doing? I'm not lying, I'm not cheating, I don't steal, I'm not greedy. I pay a tithe and of everything that I get. Thank you, God, for not making me like this other man, this publican, this tax collector. That was me in that parable of, of Jesus in Luke's gospel. And I had this big bag of righteousness that I expected God to be so impressed for. And like I said, he was as impressed as a parent is whose child pays him back from the allowance that he had given him in the first place. The Bible tells us throughout the scriptures that we are to lift up the cup of salvation. How are we to pay back God? How are we to pay our vows to the Lord? The psalmist says, I will lift up the cup of salvation and pay my vows to the Lord. What does that mean? That means when my cup is empty, I will honor God, not by filling it up and saying, hey, look, I'll hold up my empty cup my empty righteousness store, as it were, and say, Lord, I need you. It only comes through you. It only comes by you. You're my only hope. 
And God in his kindness brought me not to a chiropractic office in Elkhart, Indiana, but to a bar in Winnipeg where I was there with my buddy who was registering for a course at school, went out that evening for a dance and came home with the gal who would eventually become my wife. The gal who would lead me to the Lord Jesus Christ through her ongoing, patient, persevering, where does it say that in the Bible, Pete? Just like my brother. And so when I say we are two men who have come to the Lord because of the ministry of our wives, you understand that we mean all of the praise goes, goes to God. All the glory goes to our King. And yet God has said, or one, one pastor has said about the Lord, that God not only ordains grace, God ordains the means of grace. God determines how his grace is going to come to us. He ordains the pathway, the conduit. Neither Tina or Pam is the source of salvation for Steve or I, but they're the conduits, they're the, they're the pathway, they're the means by which God chose to pour out his mercy and grace into our lives. I hope what's happening right now is what I think probably is happening for some of you. That you're thinking about who was that person that God used to bring the gospel to your life. What was it like for you to recognize at one point your own self-dependence. That overt self-reliance that was gripping and all-encompassing your life. And how God used someone to bring the truth of who God is. The glorious truth of what God has done in Christ into your life. And then all of our presupposition of I'm a good person. Meaning I'm just better than someone else. Right? That's all a good person is nowadays. You just have to find someone worse off than you and you're good. When, when you came to that point in your life and God did so by bringing someone to open up their mouths. Perhaps timidly and... Cautiously, because we're all afraid to speak up, aren't we? We don't know what to say or how to say it. We don't want to offend. We don't want to judge anyone. And yet someone came into your life by the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And you realize that faith comes by hearing. And hearing came by the word of God. That, that all who call upon the name of the Lord would be saved. And you had not called on the Lord because you didn't need rescue. You, you were the well person that Jesus said, I didn't come for people who were well. I, I came for people who were sick. I've not come to call the righteous, Pete. I've come to call people who are sick. If you realized it, Pete. And so calling on the name of the Lord was something that had to happen. But of course, as Romans 10 mentions, how, how's anyone going to call unless they believe? And then how are they going to believe? Unless they hear the truth of the gospel. And how are they going to hear unless someone preaches to them, speaks to them, testifies to them? And how is anyone going to testify unless they are sent? For just as it is written, how beautiful on the mountaintops are the feet of those who bring good news. And so if someone is sent, someone's going to preach. And if someone preaches, someone's going to hear. And if someone hears, someone's going to believe that Jesus can actually save them. And if they believe, they're going to call and they ask Jesus to save them. And if they call and ask, they are going to be saved. Amen? Amen. That is your story if you're a Christian here this morning. Do you realize that? Have you ruminated with it for a while and meditated on it again? You know, as we said for these last few weeks, there is a tremendous danger of us as God's people of forgetting the things we think we know. When we come back to the book of Galatians in a couple of weeks, you will see that the Apostle Paul says things like, Have you suffered all these things in vain? If indeed it was in vain. Maybe you're pretending. Maybe you're playing at this Christianity thing. Maybe you're just wanting enough that God will save me so that I can then live like everyone else. But at the end of the day, I'll also go to heaven. Friends, when God saves you, God changes you. And when God changes you, he changes you into a person who has articulated in the second chapter of Ephesians. 
Ephesians chapter 2 begins with that, that awful, wonderful testimony. After Paul has made so much four different times, saying that God has done what he's done to the praise of his glorious grace in chapter 1, he begins chapter 2 saying, And you were dead. You were dead in or because of your trespasses and your sins. These trespasses and sins were not little misdemeanors. They weren't a little hiccup. They weren't you tripping over the law. Whoops, sorry, didn't mean to do that, Lord. There weren't these small little things. Well, nobody's perfect after all. You know, not everyone can be good all the time. Not really that big a deal. Something that has infected North American evangelism in the last half century. That the worst thing to do, which is the best thing for people, is the biggest insult you can have. Are you sure that you recognize you were dead in your trespasses and sins? That, that seems like the worst thing to do to, to confront people with sin. And yet it's the best thing to do because it's the only way we're going to get to the rest of this passage. Dead in my trespasses and sins. Living like what? Following the course of this world. Yep. Just like what? Following the prince of the power of the air. The spirit who is now in work in those who are disobedient. Among whom, verse 3... We all once lived in the passions and of our flesh carrying out the desires of the mind. And were by very nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. It's hard for you to believe what God has saved you from, isn't it? It's hard for us to come face to face that Bev Hallett is an awful, evil sinner apart from the work of God in her life. That sounds an insult, doesn't it? Except to Bev. She knows what God has saved her from. But it, it feels so odd, doesn't it? To think, who is the most beautiful, righteous person you know? That surely is how they were born. No. Dead. Following the course of this world. Being directed through it by the devil himself, the prince of the power of the air. Just like all the rest. Yes, we are all equal. We are all equally fallen. Desperately in need of God's course correction in our lives. So where does that course correction begin? It doesn't begin with the change of action. Or even a change of attitude. It begins with... New birth. We must, what does it say? Verse 4, but God being rich in mercy. Why? Because of the great love with which he loved us has made us alive. We had to be born again. God had to, just like in the second chapter of the book of Genesis... Take us as a piece of clay, as it were, and breathe life into us. So that man became a human living soul. Soul, We had to be breathed divine life again into us. So we'd become alive. I know that there's still something, even in my Christianity, that wants to say, well, I was dead. And then I saw Jesus and I believed him. And that made me alive. The dead person believed, and that dead person's belief gave him life. Is that what it says? It says, I was dead, I was made alive, and then I believed. Of course. Dead men, dead women do not believe. They must be made alive together with Christ. It is by grace you've been saved. And God has raised us up with him, verse 6, seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Drop down to verse 8. For it is by grace you've been saved. So that unmerited, spontaneous unmerited, I've never heard that definition, Steve, that's great. Spontaneous unmerited favor. 
They grant you we're praying it, that we get what we don't deserve. That, that's grace. Mercy is we don't get what we have earned, which is God's wrath. Mercy and grace come together there in verse 8. For by grace you have been saved through trust, belief, through faith. That's how it happens. And that's not your own doing. Brothers and sisters, if that has never jumped off the page of the Bible to you before, please let it this morning. It was not your doing. I believed. It was not your doing. What was not? What immediately precedes that? You were saved by faith, and this faith, this believing, was not your doing. Come on. Come on, Roman Catholic boy, Pete. That, that, there, I got to do something, Lord, don't I? Don't I get to contribute something? Don't I get a little pat on the back? Come on, I, at least I believed. It was not your doing, Pete. It's a gift of God. Not by your doing, not by your works, lest any of us should boast. Oh, there's a lot of boasting in our human hearts, friends. There is a lot of things that we are so desperate to take credit for. The delusion of self deception or the self-deception that results in the delusion of self-dependence rather than just throwing ourselves before the altar as it were and saying lord i'm yours save me you don't have to save me i don't deserve it i haven't earned it i am not worth it but i need it please i'm yours save me that was martin luther's great prayer from psalm i believe it's 86 that his, his chief mentor, when Luther just could not get right with God, as a Roman Catholic priest, could not go to confession long enough. And I, and I went to confession, as Steve did. Some of you know this history. And you go into the confessional, and you feel dirty because you're honest about your sin. And, and, and the, quote, priest, little p, priest, Says, go and say a couple of incantations and you're fine. And we walk out of there and we think, great, I walk down the stairs and a car comes by. Gee, what are you doing? Okay. Can I come in again? Okay. I went outside. I got mad. I was angry. Please. A couple more incantations. Okay, good. Right. Got it now. This thing, right? And, and what happens? Something else happens. Come on, Luther, you and me will go together. You again? Yeah, still me. That's what it's like. Because you think God's taking it all away. At best, it was covered up. But we're never changed internally. God never changed his heart. God had to come in and perform heart surgery. We have had heart transplant surgery. God has taken out that heart that beats with desire for beat and given me a heart of flesh that beats for my king. Not so that I can now earn my salvation, but because he has graciously given me salvation. I want to live to please him. That's what this new heart has a desire for. But you see, I skipped over a verse. I skipped over a verse because I think very often we skip over these verses, practically speaking. What's the gospel? How would you articulate the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ? I'll bet it's similar to this. Jesus Christ came into the world to save a sinner like me. Yeah, it's true. It's good news. Jesus went to the cross to pay for all of my sin. That's the gospel. Is that the gospel? It's part of the gospel. Beautiful part. One might even say heart of the gospel. Well, it's very good news. But it's incomplete. Because all too often the gospel is simply what 
God can and should and I need him to do for me. And since I can't do anything to cause him to do that for me, once he's done that for me, what do I do? Look at our lives. Parallel our lives with our neighbors, our fellow employees, our fellow parents at school with the children. The way we handle our money, or don't handle our money, the catastrophic, crippling amounts of debt that people are under in Toronto. How we speak to our wives. How we recreate with our children. We look an awful lot like the pattern of this world, living in the pattern of this world. Except we meet for an hour on Sunday morning and someday someone's going to go to our funeral and they're going to say, that Pete Charlebois, boy, he was a good guy. I knew that Steve Poirier, he was terrific. He did, he worked, he provided. And it'd all be true. And you've been to funerals like that. And it's as if all God exists for was to enable this sinful worldly person to have a reward on the other side of his sinful worldly life. Friends, there's a reason God has saved you and I. And it doesn't end with us. The gospel is indeed God sending his sinless son into this world to indeed become a man that he might perfectly represent the human race. Perfectly living under the dictates and commands of God. Going to the cross and to hang on a tree because he's being treated as if he lived my worldly, selfish life. And in vindication of all of his claims of deity, he rose from the grave and he ascended on high. And as our brother said, he still this morning lives to intercede for us as our real priest, the great high priest. And he did that so verse 7 of Ephesians 2 could be true. Do you see it there? So that. Why has God done what he's done? Made us alive together with Christ. Grace we've been saved. Raised us up with him. Seated us with him. In order that in the coming ages he might show, display, Put on display. Show the immeasurable riches of his grace. In kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. Friends, the good news is that God loves to show the glory of God. In kindness towards us. His salvation of us is a display of his glory. That's what we live to put on display. We have our personal testimony and our sharing of the gospel all the time. Friends, never miss this. The gospel is glorious but incomplete if it ends on God save me. In order that in the coming ages, in the ages since Paul wrote this to the church at Ephesus, he might display his immeasurable riches. His worth, His value, His majesty. Oh, I'm so nervous in some ways that there'll be ears that hear this and think, oh, 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 boring. Boring. Yeah, yeah, God's grace, God's glory, what majesty. But what about the air conditioner on my trailer that just gave out this past weekend? Here's a personal testimony. <laughs> What about the transmission in my car that went a month ago? What's going on with my son as he moves to Calgary? How much am I going to miss him? Oh, I haven't seen my granddaughter for two weeks. Boy, I miss her. 
How in the world did the Leafs blow it again? Apparently there was a hockey game last night. Did any of you hear about that? Yeah. <laughs> There's something that's still so natural that God is still weaning us off the world. And you see, this is how it happens. To get past the gospel being only about me and what God has done for me. I'm not saying get away from that. I'm saying just get past it, get bigger. Keep reading. God is about the glory of God. God is about displaying the glory of God. What, what, we, what, what is it in the last book of the Bible that's on display? Why, why were they upset? They were weeping in chapter 5 because no one could be found to open the scroll. Essentially, the will of God couldn't be enacted. There was no one worthy to do it. And then I saw a lamb that looked like a lion. The one, the lion of the tribe of Judah, who was worthy to open the seals and enact the will of God for the glory of God. That, that, that it tells us that Jesus himself came into this world to do the will of the one who sent him. And having saved those for whom he was sent, they will spend eternity bringing glory to God. Singing about the immeasurable riches of his glory in his kindness towards us. Brothers and sisters, don't miss that the kindness of God to Steve, myself, all of us has been done for the express purpose of putting the glory of God on display. Ask that God might give you an appetite to see that your life would be lived for the display of the value and the majesty of God. Let's pray. Father, as we bring our service to a close in a moment as we sing of your goodness. I pray, Heavenly Father, that we would join our voices with those in the heavens, as it were, who bring praise and glory and dominion and majesty to the Lord of all glory, to the one who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. We pray, Heavenly Father, that our tiny, minuscule, unimportant, insignificant lives could be used for such an eternally significant purpose as drawing us close to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And us, by our very lives, being used by you to draw others to see his glory. And to bow before him in immense glory and joy. We ask, Heavenly Father, as we sing now, that you would, Heavenly Father, I pray, hear our praise. And receive it for the glory of our King. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. So RJ, about, could you give us that last song? You got it. Thanks, brother. Yeah, we're about to sing Christ is enough. And interestingly, I've listened to Peter and what he was saying about having that heart transplanted, a heart of stone into a heart of flesh. It gives us desire to want Jesus. We, we sing a tagline or the bridge in this song, I have decided to follow Jesus. I don't even know if I can claim that I have decided to follow Jesus outside of God gave me the heart to follow him. So just, what a, what a beautiful truth. Please stand with us. Christ is my reward and all of my devotion. Now there's nothing in this world that could ever satisfy. Through every trial, my soul will sing, no turning back. I've been set free. Christ is enough for Christ is enough for me, everything I need is in you, everything I need, Christ my all and all, my 
joy in my salvation. And this hope will never fail. Heaven is our home. Through every storm, my soul will sing, Jesus is here. To God be the glory. Christ is enough for me. Christ is enough Everything I need is in you. Everything I need, I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back The cross before me The world behind me No turning back No turning back The cross before me The world behind me No turning back No turning back Oh Christ is enough for me. Christ is enough for me. Everything I need is in you. Everything I need, I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back, I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. The cross before me, the world behind me. No turning back, no turning back. The cross before turning back, no turning back. Father, we pray that you would entrench these truths in our hearts. Would you, Heavenly Father, I ask, dear God, but with eagerness, that the truth of the gospel of grace of Christ would penetrate each of our hearts. We would leave here eager to reflect his worth, his immeasurable grace. We humbly ask through Christ. Amen. Friends, we'll start our business meeting in literally five minutes if you're able to stay. Thank you very much.